an event starting. Everybody. Okay, I can now see Priscilla. Good morning. 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 Is the day for me? Turn off your sound, everybody. Turn off your sound, Jen. It's at the start of the day before all the microphones on. Is your sound not on? Is this plugged in and that's why it's not working? Space is at 100. Um, I don't know if I need to change yep, it. I can unplug it. Okay. 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 Um, not sure. Good morning. This is the day, this the, Lord is the, day the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and, be and be glad in it. It is so good, to, is pause so good to pause at the start of the day before ahead. all that lies ahead. Be it wonderful, be it wonderful exciting, and exciting, daunting, daunting dreary, dreary, or incredibly stressful. Or incredibly stressful. Whatever lies, ahead, Whatever lies ahead, it is so important, is so important to, enter into, to enter into the day with a divine peace and strength. And strength. To, arm ourselves to arm ourselves with the deep, abiding, deep, abiding knowledge that everything we do, everything we do matters to God. That His presence, that his presence with abides us. with us. That He cares, that he cares deeply for the most minute details of our lives. Celebrating with us, celebrating with us, mourning with us, and mourning through with us through the air. And flow of this beautiful life. This is the day, this the, Lord is the, day the Lord has made. Whatever it holds, Whatever it holds we will rejoice, we will rejoice and, be and be glad in it. Instead of fixing, Instead of fixing our thoughts on what lies ahead, let's take time, let's take time to fix our thoughts on the Creator, lifting our gaze, lifting our gaze beyond the temporal, gaining strength, gaining strength, stillness, and peace from the eternal God, and reconnecting with something larger than ourselves. Let's connect to His stillness, to His expansive perspective. How incredible that God, who transcends our understanding, still cares for the minute details of each day. Bring your focus to your breath, the life of God flowing in and out of your body, of the way your body gently moves with each inhale and exhale. Notice the sensation of air swirling in your nasal passage. The gentle, cool the gentle cool rush of air at your nose with each inhale and the exchange for warmth on each exhale. On each exhale. Give, thanks Give thanks for each and every breath for the life, for the life that you have. So you are so full potential. of potential, and each breath, and each is, a breath is a gift carrying you on, carrying you on each day to through each day to carry out the purpose. This is the day the this Lord, is the has, day made. The Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will and, rejoice be and be glad in it. This statement, this statement. Does not assume that our lives are trouble free. We can rejoice and be glad in the day ahead, even when it's less than ideal. This mantra is a declaration of an incredible truth that no matter what lies ahead of us today, we can know true joy and maintain true, incorruptible peace. We can do this because we are rooted and grounded in the God who holds the universe in his hands. This peace and joy the world cannot take away. This is the day the Lord has 
made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Allow this beautiful phrase to be your mantra both now and for the day ahead. Allow these words to cycle through your mind with the cycle of your breath. Breathing in, this is the day. Breathing out, that the Lord has made. Breathing in, I will rejoice. Breathing out, and be glad in it. Spend the next few minutes meditating on this beautiful truth with the rhythm of your breath. Allow it to fill your spirit with peace and courage. Even when faced with challenges, we have so much to be grateful for. Let's now spend the next minutes in contemplation of the many things for which we are grateful. And now with hearts full of gratitude, let's spend a short time bringing before God the things ahead that are weighing more heavily on our hearts. With each matter, envision yourself gently offering up your concerns to God. See yourself placing them in his hands, knowing you do not need to worry, that he hears your requests and holds your concerns deeply in his heart.
now we come back to simply sitting still in God's presence, filled with gratitude for the day he has given us and with determination that we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, good morning. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we're so excited uh, to have you here for uh, this very important topic. If you have a moment, uh, go ahead and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, shout out in the comments uh, where you're from. We want to know who's here uh, and uh, who's enjoying themselves or who's in for a uh, great time today. My name is Doug Johnson. I'm from the Palm Beach, Florida Fellowship, and I'll be sharing a little bit more about me later. Our Men of Freedom group is honored uh, to host this webinar with Illumination Publications. Uh, we're a group of men with our sister, uh, Crescenda, uh, discussing David Siemens' Healing for Damaged Emotions workbook. Uh, we're also grateful uh, for Dr. Jennifer Condon, hopefully I did not murder your name, um, and, uh, and her husband's work, publications and service uh, in our fellowship. Um, the better we understand our, our sexuality, the better we're able to manage the gifts that God has given us. In the meditation, we hope you were able to focus on um, how this is the day our Lord has made and decide to rejoice and be glad in it. In order to be able to uh, track your questions uh, for our question and answer time, we'll, we'll turn off the chat uh, commenting once, uh, once Jennifer begins her presentation. So before we get started, uh, let's go ahead and open up uh, in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you. Uh, God, we're so thankful for this day, uh, this time, and this opportunity. We're so thankful for uh, your creation, God. Um, everything and anything that in, that's in this earth, God, has come from you. We're so thankful for uh, the opportunity to be able to spread this message, God, uh, through technology. Um, it was not created by us, God. We only discovered it. And God, we just want to uh, thank you for it and uh, just take advantage of it and use it, God, uh, for your glory. Lord, we uh, want to thank everyone that has made it here, God. Uh, we all want to just invite you into our hearts, God. Allow us to freely um, open up, open up uh, our hearts, God, and our minds, God, and uh, really um, focus on ourselves, God. Uh, take in all the information, God, that you have chosen uh, for us to hear uh, today. Lord, be with us. Uh, be with the presenters uh, today, God. Be with those who are in attendance as well, too, God. Let allow us to please uh, just just flourish and grow uh, so that we can continue to just glorify you and the gifts that you have given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, now Crescenda is going to introduce uh, Dr. Conson. Hi, everybody. Uh, once again, welcome. Uh, so happy that you guys are here with us. Um, so Jennifer Kanzen, oh my gosh, my heart just warms whenever I think of Jennifer. Um, we met um, a while ago and I've seen her do her presentations and I've just been so encouraged by her and her service and her care and compassion for people. Um, it is 180% obvious that what matters most to her is God and her family. Uh, her physical family and her family in Christ. Um, I am always just so encouraged by her uh, personally. So I won't bore you with three or four pages of her credentials, but I do want you to know that not only is she a disciple who can counsel people, but she is actually a licensed marriage and family therapist. Uh, she is the director of the Center for Sexuality in San Diego. And she is a certified sex therapist. Um, she has a many more uh, 
um, responsibilities, including being an adjunct professor and a certified chemical dependency counselor. But um, I just want you all to be able to hear her heart for you today, her heart for us, her heart for God. She constantly serves. And uh, one of the things that Paul from Illumination that I appreciate about her is that she is so direct and so authentic. Um, and one of the things that uh, encourages me most about Jennifer is that she is aware of multicultural diversity issues, which requires empathy. And so in a, a number of instances, we had conversations about representation and multicultural diversity, and her heart is there about that. So without any further ado, uh, hold on to your seats because this will be amazing for marries, singles, teens, what, what, whatever you are, wherever your station is in life, uh, open up your hearts to learn something that will allow you to use God's gift even more. Here's Jennifer Condon. Your audio is off. There you go. Wait, no. I can't hear you, Jennifer. Guys, we're so sorry. Uh, we're not sure what's going on with the sound, but we're trying to fix it. So prayers appreciated. Uh, uh, we did a little test run earlier and we could hear Jennifer. Uh, so hopefully she and Tim, her amazing husband, will be able to get that settled in a second. Welcome, everybody. We got uh, San Diego here. We got South Africa. We got... Um, the Bahamas, so encouraging. Charlotte, North Carolina, that's where I became a disciple, 1986. Um, welcome everybody, so grateful you guys are here. Hey Val from Chicago, give us a shout out where you guys are from in the comments. And then we're actually gonna turn the comments off as soon as Jennifer can get started. Uh, because what we want you to do is to send us um, any questions that you have so that Jennifer can answer those questions once she gets finished the presentation. So they will be private questions. So feel free to not be shy and put questions in the comments uh, because we are going to turn off the uh, we're going to turn off the chat in a few hey. minutes. Good morning, Sharon can from South you. America. I can hear you. And Paul is helping oh, us yeah. out. This is weird. Hampton, Virginia. Hey, Naomi. Destin, Florida. Where is that, Michelle Shaman? <laughs> hey, David. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Wow, guys, we have somebody from Kenya, Africa. Anyway. Uh, how about Jen uh, logging out and coming back? How about that? Yeah. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and talk about uh, the agenda, uh, just so that you guys will know where we are. Um, let's see. All right, so uh, what we're going to talk about today, we're just going to wait uh, for Jennifer to come on in. But today for our agenda, we're going to talk about the spiritual view of sexuality. Uh, we're going to talk about how our family background influences our sexuality. Uh, Jennifer is going to touch base on challenges regarding sexual abuse, shame. Uh, so many of us carry so much shame, and especially in relation to our body image. Um, Jennifer is going to talk about the need for warm, loving touch. And that need does not go away based on your marital status. So if you are a teenager, if you are single, uh, whatever it is, uh, we all have a need for a warm and loving touch. Uh, Dr. Constance is also going to talk about the need to talk openly and honestly about sexual sexuality. And then lastly, she's going to talk about the pursuit of holiness. So, as you probably know <laughs> from the time you were a little kid, uh, you are a sexual person. And God created each and every single one of us, uh, male and female. Uh, and so, hopefully, Jennifer will be with us in a second. Let me check on her. Uh, looks like she's coming in. Yeah, I hear Sal. So sorry, you guys. We're having tech issues. Okay. I see you, Jennifer. Still can't hear you. Dear Lord, at this time, we just want to pray that you would be with the technical things. You're the one who made the ear. You're the one who made us, male and female. Uh, this is information that's going to help us, and Satan doesn't want us to reach us, uh, but you are more powerful. You created the air and all, all of our bodies, our minds, and who we are. We just turn to you at this time, Father God, knowing that you are bigger than any problem. I ask you to fix this in Jesus' name so that we can learn and heal in the areas where we need to grow. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Aaron. Appreciate We're going to do a hard refresh. So oh, this is what I mean. Okay. Well, well, well. Oh, yeah, we have her. Yeah. I hear sound. Yes. Awesome. Just close it. Sorry, hold on. We're trying to still figure this out. Can you hear me now? Yes. And Jennifer, I already went over the agenda. Can you hear me? Jennifer, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. I already went over the agenda. Okay. Okay. And yay, we're so glad you're here. Yes. The prayers worked. Jesus is Lord. Thank you, Aaron, for praying. <laughs> okay. And what are you guys hearing and seeing? We have your PowerPoint and uh, you're on the main slide. Then comes your family. And I already went over the agenda. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Well, and Yay. is everyone else hearing me? You can all let me know in the chat. We just restarted everything. So Yay. I hope that worked. Yay, it says. Okay. Yay. Amen. Good. Well, Nick, for send it. You got to turn off your video. I sure will. <laughs> I do well, love that your face. Was no fun. Uh, well, hello, everybody. And yes, this is my family, but I'm going to skip past this because we have some other important things to talk about. Although, like Resenda said, my family is very important. And so today, as we go into these pieces, this is actually from the back of Redeemed Sexuality. You're a sexual person. God created them male and female as a teen, campus student, single professional, married man or woman. From conception, God, the master artist, created you as a sexual being. 
So how do you live out your sexuality in a way that's honoring to God? And what is sexuality? Is it just intercourse or is it perhaps something much greater? I, the main phrase in this that just stands out to me is that from conception, God, the master artist, created you as a sexual being. We're not sure how to talk about it, <laughs> yet God created it. And hopefully today that's one of the things you'll gain from this is just a greater ability to have an open and honest conversation. I want to give you a taste. First of all, as we start, we're going to have some great sharing as we go of what do the scriptures teach. If you want to do a much more thorough dive on this, you can actually do it in a chapter of the book, uh, Redeemed Sexuality or The Art of Intimate Marriage. But just to give you a taste of God's view of sexuality, uh, in Ezekiel 16 and 23 is this very vivid picture of God speaking to Israel and the language that he's using. He's talking to them about idolatry, but the language that he uses is adultery. It's very vivid language in Ezekiel 16 and 23. And so God uses the language in that passage to share something. He's talking to the people about the fact that they're committing idolatry, but he's using this understanding. I'm a marriage and family therapist, so I work with a lot of couples. And one of the things that comes in a lot is betrayal. When someone has committed a sexual betrayal in the marriage and the level of pain and agony that people have when there's been that kind of betrayal. God uses our understanding of that and says, when you worship another God, this is how I feel. He uses that vivid language there to share his heart so that we can actually know him better. We tend to think of sexuality and God as like sex is here and God is over here and they're super separate. But God actually uses sexual language so that we can know him. So different from that idea. And what's really interesting is the words that the Bible uses to describe intercourse. It's used multiple different times. I'm just going to show you a couple. But in the New Testament, the word gnosko is used to describe sex between Joseph and Mary. Joseph did not know her, that's the word gnosko, until she gave birth to Jesus. And it's the same word where Jesus says, I know the sheep and the sheep know me. I know the father and the father knows me. It's a word that means a deep experiential knowing. So Jesus says this word that describes when you think about it, how well does God know Jesus and how well does Jesus know God? How well does God know us? Well, he created us while we were still in the womb. He knit us together. And so that deep, intimate knowing. That's the word he uses to describe sex between Joseph and Mary. It's actually also where Mary says that, how could I give birth to a son? I haven't known a man, she says to the angel who visits her to tell her she's going to have Jesus. So this word to know literally means I haven't had sexual intercourse with. It's the same word that's used in the Old Testament. The word is yada in Hebrew. And it's where Adam knew he yada Eve and she gave, she conceived and gave birth to Cain. Same in Jeremiah 31, that you will know the Lord. So this deep intimate knowing is the word that the Bible, that God uses to describe erotic sexuality when two people are having sex. Why is that important? Well, number one, because it describes what God intends for erotic sexuality. He intends for it to create a deep, intimate connecting between these two people who are in a married relationship. God wants us to know each other. And so he gives us this physical thing in marriage. Well, why would he use this deep word about knowing to describe sexuality. It really helps us understand God's intent for sexuality. It isn't about um, what the world puts out there, which is so different from God's intent. When you look at Song of Solomon, it's the Bible's uh, text on how sexuality should be in that relationship. And it's a beautiful example. 
it's actually the Bible is the only uh, world religion text that has an entire book on sex. That kind of lets you know the importance God places on it. So this idea of God is over here and sex is over here isn't even accurate. Sexuality was actually, as far as erotic sexuality, was intended to be something that helps us to deeply know God. Well, in the same way, God uses that sexual language in Ezekiel 16 and 23 so that we can know him. So that's true for anybody, whether they're in a married relationship or not. Sexuality is a way for us to understand the heart of God, to know God. So putting sexuality in that context all of a sudden makes a huge difference in how we view sexuality. Um, it is also echoed in the scriptures on how do we live out our sexuality, whether we're engaging in physical sexuality or not. So this is out of Romans 1, where God says he gave them over in the sinful desires of their heart to sexual impurity. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the what? The gnosko of God. So our knowledge of God literally helps us engage in the truth of God. If in uh, 1 Thessalonians, the heathen who do not gnosko God gave their bodies to sexual morality. So our literal knowledge of him, this isn't a... Um, I read my Bible, I go to church. This is a deep, intimate knowing. It's the same word. Our deep, intimate knowing of God will then guard and guide our sexuality. So God uses sexuality to be known. He wants us to know him. He uses it so that our knowledge of him can guide how we live it out. I call it a stewarding. How do we steward our sexuality? One of the things in our church family that we don't always do a great job of is explaining all the words that the Bible uses to describe sexuality. They're actually really positive. People are often not sure, is sex, po is God, is the Bible sex positive? It is. Look at the words the Bible uses to describe sex. Uh, in Proverbs 5 is talking about actually the women's breasts and he, it says, may you ever be intoxicated with her love. The word intoxicated here in reference to sexuality means literally reeling around drunk. And then in 1 Corinthians 7, it says that it's a burning passion. And in Proverbs 5, it's a comparison to streams of water, cistern, fountain, flowing water. This has got, look at the positivity that it's something that makes you feel so good. This again is erotic sexuality. This is how it God intends it to be within a marriage relationship. It isn't always like this in a marriage relationship, but this is his intent that it's so good. It makes you reel around drunk that it, you burn for passion, you burn for each other, that, that fire, that it's like a flowing water. It's constantly refreshing. God is very, the Bible is very sex positive. And one of the challenges we have is that we don't talk about this openly. It's as if we can only have this conversation, the one I'm having with you right now, if you're married or you're about to be married, you're the week before your wedding. Um, actually, our teenagers, our college students and our singles need to know that the Bible is sex positive and uses these beautiful language for when people do engage in sex. God uses sexuality to let us know him. He, our knowledge of him can guide and guard that. And God is very sex positive. Gaining a real understanding of God's intent for sexuality is a vital part of guiding and guarding our sexuality. In the church, unfortunately, we only tend to address sexuality in terms of sin. Oh, this brother, this sister is involved in masturbation. This individual is doing pornography. This husband, this wife has committed sexual morality. We talk about it in terms of sin, of fantasizing, of lust, but we don't talk about the positive terminology around sexuality. And even when it comes to the sinful part, we're uncomfortable talking about the language. 
Like we don't want to use the word masturbation. We don't want to talk about pornography use, especially actually among women. And we are uncomfortable talking about same-sex attraction and the alternative sexualities, gender. So we avoid it instead of having just an honest, direct, I appreciate what Crescenda said, that I'm direct. Um, it's important to be, especially around sexuality. And because we don't teach the positives around sexuality, we just give a list of do's and don'ts often. What that will create is the feelings of guilt and shame that sex is about dirty, shameful, negative things. And then when someone does confess sexual sins, if someone does share it, we tend to shame it very differently from what you see in the scriptures. God is very, if you actually look up, I had somebody ask me uh, just yesterday, Jennifer, you said that you did this thorough um, study of the scriptures to find out what God's under, what the Bible teaches about sexuality. How do I do that? Well, when you do that, you're going to find out that the majority of the scriptures are about what not to do. They are about sexual sin. So how does God deal with sexual sin? In Deuteronomy, he clearly says, so this would be sexual immorality or premarital sex. Two people who are involved in premarital sex in Deuteronomy 22, it lays it out that you take them outside the town, you stone them. This is the scripture reference in Deuteronomy. And then in John 8, we see God on stage, literally. This is Jesus. The, a woman is brought to him in adultery. So she's caught in sexual sin. She's brought to Jesus. And when he says to them, you know, if you're without sin, throw a stone. Nobody does. They all drop their stones. And he says to the woman, you know, is anyone condemned? She says, no. He says, neither do I. Now leave your life of sin. Go, leave your life of sin. How does he deal with a person caught in that sin? He says, I don't condemn you. Just even thinking about this is kind of emotional because you see the heart of God in this moment. Do we respond when someone is caught in sin or they come and confess their sin to you? Do you respond the way Jesus did? Jesus literally shows us what God does with sexual sin. He's very serious about the damage of it. He's very serious about the problems it causes in our lives, but he's incredibly compassionate we also need to respond to one another in that way when someone is caught in sin confesses sin to us to really imitate the heart of jesus so what we just took a look a good thorough look at well a beginning look at is god's intent for sexuality god the biblical understanding of sexuality sometimes it also helps to understand how we develop sexually so again i'm going to tap into a little bit of that how how do we become the sexual person we are? It's called your sexual self schema, the way you view yourself as sexual person and the way you view sexuality. Well, your family upbringing has a big imp impact on that. Um, if your family talked about sexuality, then that can make a big difference on how you view sexuality. If they didn't, that's where a lot of my own research has shown that when families don't talk honestly and openly about sexuality, then it creates this, this is a hidden thing. This is shameful. If they don't talk about the stage of puberty, about what's happening to the changing body, about how the penis will become erect, nighttime emissions around the changing of the breasts, of the scrotum, of the hair growth in the pubic area. So the openness about puberty, if that's not done in families, it says this stuff is shameful. We hide it. It's taboo. So that taboo idea, that's worldwide. I get to teach your brothers and sisters worldwide in uh, many countries throughout the world. And this idea of taboo is everywhere. <laughs> and it's really connected to families not talking openly and honestly about sexuality. And sometimes it's connected, the way you view sexuality might be connected to how your family interacted around sexuality. If they didn't, I had a, a couple where the, the, the husband I was working with, he remembered that his dad, when his, he could hear his dad ask his mom for sex and she would get mad and shove him away and hit him and, you know, oh, and get upset. And he said, 
I thought to myself growing up, I will never be in that situation. I will never let that happen. So he had a hard time initiating with his wife because of the, the view he had of sexuality. I had another uh, individual, her, she would drive around in the car with her dad and he would comment on women's breasts all the time. And she was a young child. So those early experiences around how parents interacted around sexuality, comments they made, jokes, it affects the way people think about sex and think about themselves as a sexual person. The, the other common thing that happens is that young children touch themselves, they explore themselves, they explore each other, and how the family responds to that. If you've got, you know, Johnny touches his penis when he's four years old and mom sees him and says, that's dirty, don't do that. You know, those kinds of, I'm using kind of an exaggerated um, example, but those kinds of negative responses to what is pretty much a normal exploration that happens uh, with young children. So, or if a young man, I had someone share in my office, he was masturbating, his mom walked in, and then she walked back out and never talked about it. No discussion. So the lack of talking about exploration and arouse, being aroused and how sex works, the lack of open discussions in families, not just like the talk, like I'm, um, you know, 10 years old and my parents explain how sex works. So that's the birds and bees talk, not just that talk, although most families don't even do that. But the ongoing discussion around sexuality is, is vital. Talking about these sticky subjects on pregnancy, arousal, LGBT, sex, premarital sex, parents tend to think if I don't talk about sex with my kid, then they won't have it. And we do the same thing in church. If we don't talk to our singles too much about what's happening in our married sexuality, then they won't ever struggle. Actually, one of the things I find with singles that they're asking, can we please openly talk about this? I would love to talk to the marrieds about this. We, we have to change that within our body. Open communication it often starts in the family. The other piece that happens in family upbringing that hugely impacts how we view sexuality is if there's been any violations, any violating touches, sexual abuse, molestation, any kinds of traumas, but not only the trauma, how the family responds to it. I have um, a family that I am uh, recently working with and when a child brings up what's happened to them and the family has a negative response like grandpa wouldn't do that, honey, uncle so-and-so wouldn't do that, mommy would never, When or I've had an individual who she had been raped, she went and shared it with her mother, and her mother said, hmm. So a non-response or a negative dismissive response, boy, it communicates a lot, and it impacts somebody's long-term view of sexuality. And then, of course, exposure to media of any kind. I mean, goodness, if you watch TV shows and the movies, how do they show sex? <laughs> uh, we were just watching a very popular show recently, and it was so typical. You know, it's with heavy breathing <gasps> and clothes are flown everywhere and somebody's shoved up against a wall and they throw each other in the bed and they both have orgasms at the same time. And then nobody ever has any problems with sex, like erectile dysfunction or pain. This is not reality. And yet this is what TV and pornography, pornography makes sex. It's, it's not real number one, but it makes sex look like this picture. So movies, TV, magazines, from those of you who are older, make sex appear a certain way that actually just isn't accurate. But then people have those expectations. This is what it's supposed to be like. So our media, our background, or if you were exposed, like if your parents, your somebody around you was doing pornography when you were young, that will affect your view of sexuality as you mature. Definitely, I want to ask you all this. I want to do a poll here. So we have not done this before. Let's see how it works. Um, let's start it. Did your family talk about sex growing up? I'm going to publish it right now. Let's see how it works. Go ahead and on your screen for those of you who can. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. Did your family talk about sex growing up? Oh my goodness. Look at the nose. Whoever said yes, they're getting swamped by all the nose. 
Wow, right? So what you're showing me right now, some, okay, so some of you are saying some. We've got an 82% no, that's a hovering around 80. So 10% yes, and I would say this is pretty accurate. Okay, so about about 10% of you some. So what people will say is my dad pulled out a book, my mom sat down with me after the high school talk or the, we talked once. So that might be the sum. So yeah, around 80%. Oh, that worked. How fun is that? So the numbers that you're sharing with me right now are actually pretty common. Um, most families don't talk about sexuality. And it's a huge piece. This is just a joke about it. Am I glad to get that straightened out? Now I can go home and explain it to my dad. <laughs> some people, like those of you who put some, it might be because literally the, you might have talked about it when you came home from the, the class during your, your middle school or your high school. Um, I just had the facts of life talk with our son. And I can't believe what I learned. Often the reason why families, parents don't have the conversation is because they, the parent is uncomfortable. The parent has their own issues with sexuality or the, the couple in their married relationship doesn't talk about it openly. So they're not, they're having a hard time talking with their kid about it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a relationship wide issue. So Crescenda is now going to share about her experiences. We've talked about family upbringing right now and the impact of that. So Crescenda is going to share. Uh, thanks so much, Jennifer. And welcome, everybody. I know a lot of people had some technical difficulties getting in, and I understand you're in. So we're so glad you're here. Sorry about that. And just one note that we turn comments off for a public commenting. Uh, in the chat, and we just want you to send any questions privately to us uh, so that Jennifer can answer them at the end. Um, a couple of slides back, Jennifer talked about the impact of family upbringing and sexual abuse and sexual trauma. Um, so I just wanted to share a personal story and to let you all know that um, I actually, at 12 years old, in the seventh grade, as a little girl, was sexually assaulted by a man in the neighborhood who was 19 years old. And at the time, uh, a bunch of people tied me down with a rope. It was just really highly traumatic. Um, but at the time, I really didn't know what impact that had on me other than I felt tons of shame and I felt really like I couldn't talk to anybody about it, couldn't tell anybody about it. I didn't feel like it was my fault, but I definitely did not feel that because of my family upbringing and because of our culture in America and everywhere, um, I didn't feel like I could talk about it. So what happened was, was that it impacted me in a way, uh, in ways which I hadn't, hadn't even imagined. Uh, one simple way that it impacted me that I've seen with a lot of sisters was the clothes that I wore. <laughs> I'm about six feet tall and it wasn't until I was probably in my thirties that my roommate said, we're gonna buy you a mini skirt. I'm like, I'm not wearing a mini skirt. And it was because of this trauma that happened. Um, and it definitely impacted my ability to trust people and to build healthy relationships. So I'm talking about a sexual trauma uh, from when I was 12 years old and the impact that it had on me later in life. I felt so much hypervigilance where I felt like I needed so much protection because I felt powerless in many ways. And later on in life, I actually even had panic attacks uh, a few times when someone was walking behind me or um, even one day I remember sitting in church thinking that I was sick, sitting beside my friend Kim Campbell up in Philadelphia thinking I was sick. And it was actually a panic attack because a brother was sitting beside me. And lastly, some of the impacts uh, I definitely dealt with and was diagnosed with depression and anxiety in about 2003. Um, and it wasn't just because of this traumatic event, but it was because of other things that were going on in my family. Um, so those are some of the impacts that happened because of that traumatic event. But the good news is that I did go to counseling with a professional licensed therapist. 
and I continued my personal growth efforts. And now I get to support other people uh, with their personal growth efforts. So some of the things that I get to do now personally, uh, because of the things that have happened to me that God's working for good is that I provide therapy and coaching to people. And Doug mentioned uh, our Men of Freedom group where a group of amazing men are reading and talking about healing for damaged emotions, that book. This is the second men's group and I've done about, facilitated about 14 women's groups. Uh, so I'm so grateful that I get to actually now serve other people. And um, also one of the other ways that I support people is through my own book. I wrote a book called Spiritual Maturity, God's Will for Emotional Health and Healing. And what I see in reference to our spirituality and our sexuality is that we can only be as healthy uh, spiritually and sexually as we are emotionally. So our emotional health, our emotional healing, our emotional intelligence is interdependent with our spiritual health and our sexual health. So if you haven't worked on your emotional health and you feel that you are having some issues spiritually and or sexually, please take a look at those things and feel free to contact me if you need some resources. I've just seen how vitally important emotional health and intelligence is to our ability to live out God's plan for our spirituality and how crucial it is to live out God's plan for our sexuality. Thanks so much for listening. Resenda, I really appreciate <clears throat> you sharing. Um, I don't know if you all can see me because my video is frozen, but I'm just going to assume you can and that those in control have um, can let me know if they can't. Crescenda, thank you so much for sharing so vulnerably. Um, sometimes it can be challenging to really hear specific stories. If you have a background in sexual abuse or sexual trauma, um, go ahead and get whatever support you need through that. Um, if someone can let me know if you can hear me because my video is not showing that I'm live. So I'm going to assume you can and I'm going to go on. Yes, Jennifer, we can hear you. Yes. Lovely. Good. Uh -huh. So another piece about sexuality in families and upbringing is actually around the area, not of sex directly, but around touch. So this has to do with, and, and I'm sure if you, uh, if Crescenda and I could sit and talk about this, we could have a more, even a more thorough conversation on the impact that happens on touch when someone's been violated, but even when there, you have a family that doesn't touch, that there, there is lack of affection within the family, or, and this happens a lot when I'm working with people where they will um, experience affection in their family, but when they're younger, that once they hit the, the uh, teenage years, they feel like, gosh, my father was really affectionate. My mom was really affectionate when I was younger, but then, and one of the reasons for the parents, because I talk with them as well, is that they, I had a mom ask me at a workshop, she said, I, my son's 12, he loves to lay with his head in my lap, but now that he's 12 and that means his head's close to my vagina, should I let him keep laying that way? Or I have dads ask, my daughter still likes to sit in my lap. Should I keep doing that? You know, she's growing, she's developing. So parents often aren't sure what to do during those developing years. So then they pull back. So there can be, or somebody just doesn't like touch that they, their mother will tell them, oh yeah, since you were a baby, you went, ah, whenever we tried to hug you. So people will have all kinds of different experiences around touch growing up. And then, of course, as Crescenda was sharing, anytime there's any kind of violating sexuality or even violating touches, I had a young woman share that she'd never, she said, I've never been molested, I've never been abused, but she was still struggling with, and she was having these, these um, unusual responses to the process of therapy. And she finally shared with me, you know what, my dad did, I do remember, he we were standing next to each other. He put his hands down underneath my underwear and touched my buttocks. 
She said it only happened once. She loved and respected her dad. She was an adult. She had a close relationship with him. But that one memory, and she'd never dealt with it. She'd never talked about it, had sent her on a trajectory in her upbringing. So violating touches can be clear sexual abuse and trauma, or it can be sexually violating touches that are molestation, or it can be any kind of touch anywhere to the body that is unwanted. So the lack of touch, too much touch, violating touches, they affect how we respond or how we need or how we have touch throughout the years. And so what that does, it impacts our sexuality big time, actually. There are amazing benefits to touch. We need touch. Um, the therapist whose work I use a lot, she calls it skin hunger. And we see it biblically. Jesus touched a lot. I could go into all of the research that supports the need for touch. Our bodies need it. And Jesus was the master of it. If you think about it, we know that he could heal somebody without ever touching them. He could send the vibes through the air and they would be fixed. So he didn't have to touch them. And yet all but like two times, maybe three, he literally touches them. Peter is like sinking in the water. He could have picked Peter up and a la, you know, Star Wars and just moved him back into the boat. But he reached down and picked him up. So Jesus touches the children, the the guy whose uh, ear got cut off, he touches him and he's the guy who's come to arrest him. Jesus touched people. We need touch. We need to be giving to one another. In our singles ministries, we're not always sure what to do with that because there's so much fear around. We don't want somebody to become sexually involved. So we better be careful about touch. And yet we need it. We've got to talk about touch. So not only do we need to talk about sexuality openly, we actually need to start talking about affection and how do we do it? Can somebody be too affectionate? Um, and can we, um, can we touch in ways that are unwanted and we just don't talk about it? So that dilemma is also something that needs to be openly talked about in families. Sexuality is a lifelong growth. It starts at birth, infants and toddlers um, touch themselves. You can actually even see it in the womb. Uh, well, actually, sexuality starts in the womb because you're created male or female within the womb. Those early childhood experiences I just explained, any dehumanizing sexuality, issues with gender. So this would be if um, a family has, this is what a boy does, this is what a girl does kind of rules. Or if someone's questioning their gender identity, like, I don't, I see all these boys, they're sportsy. I'm not sportsy. I'm not like them. I see all of these girls who like to play with Barbie and I don't like to play with Barbie. I like to, I'm not like her. So questions about, I'm not like these pictures I'm seeing about gender. That happens. It can happen pretty early on, three, four, five, but most people, when it comes to the development of attraction to the same sex or the development to to of uh, transgender, uh, as in like, am I not a female and born in a female body, but I don't feel like I belong in this body? Do those questions start when about six, uh, kindergarten is typical, about six, seven years old, it gets stronger in middle school. So development continues past grade school into middle school. And then some, a young person becomes aware of the messages on TV and in their on their school playground puberty happens and how the family responds to it and then definitely when that adolescent now starts having interactions sexually and how those interactions go and how families respond and what happens and what they get exposed to all of those things impact the development of sexuality and impact your view of sexuality now the specifics i'm just tapping on this so that you know the resources the development of alternative sexuality, so this would be same-sex attraction, um, and anything in the LGBT community is, I would point you towards the work of Yar House. He talks about some really helpful things in regards to how people label their sexuality, what they give weight to, is really um, important to explore. Our biology is one piece, our DNA, our genitals, 
our identity, I feel feminine, I feel masculine, or as a female, I don't feel feminine. So our gender identity, the our attraction and the persistence of that attraction and how we behave, the things we do, and then what our belief systems are. So Yar House is one of the few that actually includes belief systems in the development of sexuality and the development of sexual attraction. So his work would be great for you to examine. What we put weight on really determines how we live out our sexuality. And then um, the other piece that he does is he does a great job of explaining that development. So go ahead and read his work if that would be helpful to you. Obviously, I highly recommend. If you've never read, I was actually going to put a poll in here. Who's read Guy Hammond's book? And I should have, but I didn't. So if you have not read Guy Hammond's book, if you've heard him but not read him, buy his book. We do need to understand because it's a it's a big question in our world. It's the number one question I get asked around same-sex attraction and transgender and bisexuality is, you know, is somebody born with it? Bi is it biological? We need to explore and openly talk about these questions. Um, I highly recommend these different texts to at least begin that conversation. Other pieces that affect sexual development is body image. This is actually a big untalked about piece. If your parents made negative comments about your body growing up, or if they made negative comments about their own body, if they made comments about your weight or your lack of weight, you're so skinny, you're like a zipper, or mm, you're putting on a few there, you should probably watch what you're eating, or mom was on diets, or dad you know, kept insisting on bulking out, or dad had issues with diet. So parents' comments around body and weight have a pretty big impact. I have a, um, an individual who was in a research study I did who shared how her dad would put her sister who was obese on the scale in front of the family, the whole family standing around. And this individual developed anorexia, the sister did um, for years and battled with it for years. So she wasn't talked about negatively. Her body wasn't, but someone in her family's was. So those those family backgrounds around the body very much, uh, the woman I talked about whose dad would comment about women's breasts, uh, she would wear bulky clothing her entire life. Um, the same with the woman whose sister was put on the scale. So covering up the body, she shared that she, loving, good husband, and she had a problem being naked in front of him and they'd been married for decades. So the challenges around body image impact sexuality over time, especially if someone develops late or develops early than the norm. So this is a female who might be developing breasts early on and people make comments or a male who doesn't end up muscular and people make comments because uh, Muscles for men on body weight is pointed out a lot or lack of musculature or someone's short or small or they're big and bulky and or they are uh, as a female, they have extra weight is a, probably the biggest thing that's paid attention to for women as far as negative things around the body. So as they develop, as people make comments, if there's practices within the family around dieting um, and then media. I mean, if you just look at media, it will impact the way someone views their body and then how they feel about their body when they are engaged with someone sexually. This comes up a lot with the married couples I work with. I mean, if you look at it, this is an actual, the photo on the right is the uh, doctored photo. And uh, when she, when this was taken of her, she actually complained and made them correct the photo. So we, the media will change this and say, this is what a human body is supposed to look like. And she's like, this is not what I look like. They'll change the contour of the face. They'll change, like just take off fat rolls because you know, people don't have them. You know, take away skin blemishes. Again, changing the tone, the color of the skin, the shape of the face. Get rid of the gray and the wrinkles change the color, bulk up the muscles some, change the color again, bulk up the muscles. <laughs> this rather popular figure, 
the correct figure, the correct picture is on, I think on your right. So our media sets it up. We need to reclaim the view of the body and get a biblical view of the body. This is what the scriptures teach about the body. You were bought at a price. You were bought at a price. So honor God with your body. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This word here, fearfully, um, is the same word about how we should be, uh, stand trembling before God. Wow, oh my goodness. That kind of, that looks, so uh, those of you listening, do you, when you are naked in front of your mirror, do you look in your mirror and go, wow, look how awesome God made my body. Probably not because a lot of us don't. And yet that's, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. The scriptures say that we often in dealing with body image need to reclaim the biblical view of our bodies. The term I really am loving recently is I appreciate my body. Look at what my body can do. I can walk. I can reach for things. I can hold stuff. I can talk. My kidneys, my liver, my stomach, they work great. I have nose hairs that protect things from coming in my nose. Our eyelashes are amazing. They protect my eyes. Our body is amazing. The eyeball is fascinating. When's the last time you studied the eyeball? Our bodies are created by God. So do this with me right now. As you're listening, close your eyes. Put your hand on the part of your body you're not really fond of. Put your hand there. I've got mine on my waist. I have extra weight on my body. I don't like it very much. So I'm putting my hands there. Wherever you don't like a part of your body, touch it right now. And then keeping your eyes closed, say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Say it with me. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, you can open up your eyes. Whatever part of your body you were touching that you're not particularly fond of, God made your body. When we touch, say, the stomach, think about what's underneath that hand, that, that hand that's touching that stomach. There's amazing things in your gut. God made us. We need to reclaim our view of the body. And that includes the sexual parts of our body. That includes the vagina. That includes the penis and all the parts of the genitals. God made not just your foot and your brain and your beautiful eyes. God made all of the genitals. So what's really funny is though, <laughs> we don't like to talk about those parts. Let's talk about them for a minute. Okay, say these with me. As you're listening, say these words along with me that are on this slide. Toe, forehead, eyebrow, kneecap. Speak with me. Teeth, kidney, throat, lungs, mouth. Keep going. Clitoris, vulva, penis, vagina, scrotum, breasts, oral sex, intercourse, semen. I'm actually thinking some of you might be <laughs> might be listening to this out in the open and you're like, I'm not saying these words out loud. I actually do this when I have a live crowd. We all say them together and the room starts to kind of laugh and get uncomfortable. You know, um, we don't know how to talk about even the biological parts of our body because we're uncomfortable or it feels shameful. And yet these are, these are parts of your body, just like your kneecap. So when you look at this previous list, okay, God made all of these parts and God made all of these parts too. And it's important that we're able to talk openly and honestly. I work with married couples who don't use the actual words. I work with parents who are teaching their children and they call it the wee-wee and the cha-cha and the chi-chi and I mean, just all kinds of words. We need to make it normal to to call it what it is and take away the shame and the taboo. We use often these other words to, 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 to make, to say, we, we don't talk about this. Shh, we don't talk about this. So we use these euphemisms. We need to talk openly and honestly about our physical sexual bodies. Um, and a big part of that is understanding what's happening with our physical bodies. So when a, a woman or a man becomes aroused, sexually. Um, it's called vasocongestion. All of the blood flow comes to the genitals 
and they start to throb and tingle and the penis will become erect, but the vagina and the vulva will also have some erection sometimes. So that physiological response, it's actually initially controlled by the lower spine. In other words, like when you go to the doctor and they, they hit your knee with a little mallet and your knee goes, woo. So that movement is actually controlled. You can't see me, but I'm touching my lower spine. It's controlled by the lower spine. They're checking to see, is it working? Is your neurology all the way from your brain, all the way down your spinal column, is it working? Well, the arousal response, the blood flow to your genitals is actually immediate. You, you're not, your brain, this part of your brain system isn't working yet. It's controlled by that lower spine. Boom, blood flow comes throbbing, an erection happens. When that happens to you and you're not instigating it, you're not looking at pornography, you're not touching yourself, it just happens because a thought crosses your mind, um, for a brief touch happens or just happens out of the blue. How about we say, oh, well, that's my God made body. Look at that, it, it works. <laughs> We do have a body that responds sexually. God actually made that response happen immediately. I was working with a couple where um, they were watching TV and a, um, a video came on, a, a commercial came on and he became erect and she noticed it. She got really angry. And I just taught her them about this is what happens to the body. And how about when we have that happen, when we have that arousal happen, how about we do go, wow, God made my body. Isn't that fascinating? It's, it's working well. And now I can bring in my values and what's happening in my life and decide how to live with that. I might go have sex with my spouse or I don't necessarily have to. I can just say, oh, I'm feeling aroused. I might, as a single person who's not engaging sexually, just go, okay, I'm feeling aroused. But I'm not going to necessarily, I'm bringing in my values, my belief system. I'm not going to stimulate myself to reaching ejaculation or orgasm, but I'm going to call a friend. I'm going to go on a walk. I'm going to go for a hike. So what we do with our arousal, instead of shaming it, to be able to say, wow, my vagina is awesome. My body is amazing. Look how well it works. That one piece really helps deal with shame and and let me hit on shame because number one, being able to say, wow, my body's awesome, makes a big difference on how we deal with our sexuality. Also recognizing when we feel shame is vital. And sometimes people feel shame just at that little bit of arousal. Um, pornography and masturbation, um, talking about it can create shame. Carnes and his work on um, helping people with addiction around pornography and masturbation, he shares how uh, shame, overcoming shame is a huge piece on overcoming issues with sexuality. It's important that uh, people examine that. Also, sometimes people who have been sexually abused, um, they'll feel, I have a client right now. She said, I'm, I have never told anybody this. I will use the abuse scenarios when I'm with my spouse to become aroused because I'm not feeling very aroused by him. So I'll picture this and this is, I'll picture the abuse and it makes me aroused. Or other people will get flashes of the abuse in their mind and it will create an arousal and they feel shame about that. When actually both of those things happen commonly. Um, if you had things happen to you where you were assaulted, you might feel shame about something. Actually, Christenda shared that, that something that was done to her, a wrong that was done to her, she felt shame about. Sometimes people feel shame about the things they did, that they engaged in. In my research, most of the shame around sexuality is connected to some of these, um, the, the, I talked about it earlier, the don'ts, the rules, don't do this, don't touch, don't watch this, don't wear that, don't move like that, don't be with that person, the rules. Um, sometimes shame is because as far as in development, especially comes from um, the negative responses that someone gets about their body. That was a big one in my research that when someone was shame, had shame about their, their body, then they felt shame about sexuality. Um, sometimes people have made shaming comments in their, in, in your background. 
one woman, her mother used to say to her, you're going to get pregnant by the time you're 16. Or, you know, so shaming comments growing up can create shame around sexuality. And then honestly, the biggest thing, reason why people feel shame is because of the lack of talking openly and honestly about sexuality. Um, Aaron is now going to share about his experiences in these areas. And I... I saw him on earlier. Aaron, are you on? I'm not sure if I'm seeing the correct view here. Oh, Aaron, can you turn on your video, your video and audio? He was on earlier. I did see him earlier. Mm -hmm. You with us, Aaron? He was having some technical difficulties too. Oh gosh, right? <laughs> and I... Maybe he needs to pray again like he did before. And <laughs> come on, Aaron. Come on in the room. Uh, there. I'm trying. Oh, Aaron, we can hear awesome. you. So can hear you. Go ahead and share. Yeah, I can hear you. And can you turn your video on too? If not, go ahead and share because we can hear you. You can turn on the audio. I know. Please, please, please. That was what I was doing. It's okay if you if you don't have the video right now. Just it's the audio is what we need. Can you share, Aaron? I don't know if you can hear us anymore. All right, Jennifer. I think we should move on then. Okay, Aaron. When you can hear, I just sent him a a, a note. When he can hear, we will pull him in. Um. Because understanding shame is actually a pretty important part of um, dealing with sexuality in our lives and talking openly and honestly about it. Often what people do is when people express shame, we say, you shouldn't feel ashamed. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> when people express shame, go ahead and say, ah, you feel shame about that and have a good conversation instead of telling them you shouldn't feel shame. Find out why they do and draw it out. So I'm giving you an example here of ways to talk openly and honestly about sexuality. Um, we aren't live going to be doing this, but I want to highly recommend something. Meet with somebody that you're close to and have this conversation. Take these uh, slides, which I believe are uploaded. If they're not, they're going to be, so that you can just take these questions and sit with someone that you trust and have this conversation. How did you learn about sex growing up? How did your family discuss sex? Obviously it's the conversation, it's going to be important to have it with someone you trust because you're going to be talking about tender things. You know, did you experience anything negatively growing up? What kind of experiences have you had that made you feel shame about sex? Is there anything that you've wanted to bring up about sex, but haven't felt comfortable bringing up? Do you feel like you have relationships now where you can openly discuss sex. Well, I want to ask you this very question. Um, I'm going to pull up another poll here. So let's ask you guys. Do you have someone currently that you can talk to openly about sexuality? You have a few choices. Do you have someone currently in your life that you can have a genuine, open, honest conversation um, not just about, and by the way, not just about sin, but about sexuality. And so, oh, I'm so encouraged. This audience is giving me lots of yeses. That's, that's really great. We've got about 30% rate of probably, <laughs> but we don't necessarily. And then there's a few of you chiming in with, no, there's no one I feel comfortable with. Ah, this is so good. This might be what you call a, um, <laughs> uh, when you're doing research, uh, our research is based on people that would come to a class like this. So we have about a 50% rate of yeses, which is amazing. And that might be why you felt comfortable joining this class. Um, that's great. 50%. That's a much higher than I usually get. So it's interesting, about 30% of you saying, I probably do, but we don't. What would it be like to start having those conversations? And then 
about 15% of you or so saying, nope, I don't have anybody I can talk to. We need, so those of you who do have somebody to talk to, you need to go find those ones who say, I probably do, but we don't talk about it. I do find that even in our discipling relationships, um, we have to intentionally make sure we're talking openly and honestly. I see Aaron's video. I don't know if I hear Aaron yet, but I see his video. Hello, can you hear Yay! me? Yay! So let's go ahead and we'll end this poll. Hello. Hello. Yes, Aaron, we can hear you. Aaron, you can always turn your video off if you're having issues with the connection part for you. So go ahead and share, would you please, Aaron? You can. Well, I don't know if he can hear us telling him. Uh, he's turned off his mic. Okay. Boy, we could hear him when we started, but now we can't. Can you hear me, Major Tom? Yes. Can you hear me, Major Tom? Yes, please share. Can you hear me? Yes, please share. If I turn off my video, can you hear me? Yes, yes. please share. Yes. Can people hear me? Yes. Yes. Please share. Yes. All right. Amen. Well, okay. I'm going to try to put my face back on. Okay. Turn. Apparently I can't do face. Hello. Anyway. Yes. I think I, I, I think you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Can't hear me. Okay. I'm going to turn off my face so you can hear me. Oh, you can. Okay. Amen. All right. I'll turn off my face anyway, just to make things simple. Hi, everybody. My name is Aaron. I started pornography at age 10 with my dad's Playboys. I would cut out the pictures of the women and it continued on for um, about 25 years. Uh, right before I got baptized, I uh, stopped at age 35. I was raised a uh, Quaker. My parents were very liberal. Uh, about political stuff, but not about personal stuff. There was no talk about sex, what good sex was, bad sex. I think I learned, uh, you know, the so-called birds and the bees from friends, not my parents. My first sexual encounter was with a prostitute at age 23. Um, I was sexually shamed by a live-in girlfriend from age 26 to 31. If I didn't satisfy her, she would verbally and emotionally abuse me. My first marriage was impacted by my pornography addiction. Um, it was just kind of a symptom of how self-engrossed I was. Uh, sexual hangups persisted in my current marriage. Shame and emotional scars prevented me from initiating with my wife. This deeply hurt our marriage. The man is socialized to be the initiator and to pursue the woman. But when we have shame, poor self-image and emotional scars, this pursuing can be close to impossible. Uh, this hurt my wife. Her response added to my shame, which led to a downward spiral. Uh, things started to improve when I was able to face my shame head on, uh, be open and vulnerable. We've been able to have some healing talks, and now we're more hopeful, um, you know, about our marriage and about that part of our marriage. Uh, but I can attest that shame, uh, even if you're not being shamed by your current partner, the history of shame can have a very uh, detrimental effect on your sexuality and your marriage. Thank you for listening. Boy, Aaron, thank you for being so vulnerable um, in front of who knows how many different people. And talking about shame is so vital. Talking openly and honestly about how it comes up from early years and all the way into marriage. And I really appreciate you sharing that vulnerably. You know, um, there is some great work to do around the issue of shame, both with a professional ther therapist as well as in things that we read. Honestly, one of the biggest things that helps with shame both is a professional um, therapist as well as being able to talk about it in a group. So I highly recommend shame. Uh, being involved in group treatment. 
that makes a big difference. So have these conversations. Go ahead and take these questions, take a picture of the screen, whatever works for you, and have these conversations. You know, I get asked, when I get asked to teach on sexuality, um, I'll have a good chunk of the time, people will say, hey, can you teach a lesson on purity? And I am willing to do that. And I do. However, often we see the idea of talking about purity is very negatively. You know, people will literally say, I was pure until I was married. And then I'm like, I hope you were pure after you were married too. <laughs> um, purity is a, is a lifelong, beautiful thing. And often we have to kind of reclaim it. And so I think the word um, holiness is super helpful. So let's talk about how do we pursue holiness? I think number one, we have to re- define purity. I love the word actually in Philippians, and I didn't put the scripture in here. It literally says it's the, sh the, the, sh the light from heaven shining upon something. We have this opportunity to be um, filled with God's light, to be um, pure and holy, not just in our sexual purity, but in our life. How amazing is that? So we all, many of us live in parts of the world where you get water that has been treated that's pure. If we buy bottled water and we drink it and it's cold and you've just been on a run or done something, gonna hike and you drink it, it's so refreshing. That's how God intends us to view purity, that it's so refreshing. Often we make it about the do's and the don'ts. And so I want to kind of give you kind of a different experience around pursuit of purity. I do want to make some points before we go into those specifics. It is not just a female thing. We tend to think women don't struggle with this. Um, as far as pornography in particular, about 90% uh, of men have done pornography at one time. I'm just throwing out a, a number, the research studies say somewhere around that number. And it used to be a much lower percent of women, but it's now at about 50%. The internet has changed things dramatically. Women also struggle with looking at pornography, with masturbating. Men do, we do, people do. We need to not just have support, support groups for men. We need to have support groups for women. And we need to have a really honest conversation about what's pulling people. Why are they drawn to doing that or viewing that or engaging in that? James 1, uh, 13 says that um, by his own evil desires, a man is dragged away and enticed, and that gives birth to sin, which gives birth to death. So um, we tend to focus on the sin that becomes death. We talk about that, but what we don't talk about is that word enticed. He is dragged away and enticed. What's enticing someone? There's a reason why someone is drawn to that. And that reason might be that they're very stressed that day. It doesn't excuse the use to say I was stressed, so I did pornography. But often people are using pornography as if they are taking a stress medication. <laughs> they're taking some kind of mental health medication. They're using it to medicate their emotions. We should probably find that out. What's the pull? Why is someone drawn? Um, I work with married couples. And one of the things they don't talk about much is what is he looking for? What's he drawn to? What's she drawn to when she views that, when he views that? Having that conversation and being an, having an open and honest conversation about that can really make a difference in someone's, what I'm going to now use the term recovery. So how does someone recover from? I get a lot of questions. I am an addiction specialist about does someone have an addiction? And we're not going to go into that today. But... Let me, let me encourage you with a couple pieces. If you have an understanding of I'm involved in something that either is a compulsive behavior, like I keep trying to stop, I keep trying to stop, and I keep going back to it, or I'm doing it more and more, or I'm doing more and more extreme things, or I continue doing it even when it's causing major problems in my life. So those would be how you would describe addiction or compulsive behaviors. If I'm involved in some kind of compulsive behavior, how do I 
recover? How do I work a program? Let me just give you some basic things to pay attention to. Join a support group. Get individual support. Having a sponsor. I have several clients right now who are part of SA or AA or NA. Join and get a sponsor. That's different than the brother or sister that says, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm struggling too. So that's peer support. Having a sponsor or a mentor who guides you through your process of recovery is a whole different thing. We need that. Get a therapist to guide the process. How about in your marriage? If it's affecting your marriage, then do couples counseling and do couples recovery. So there's individual recovery, but then there's couples recovery. Um, that's actually my book that's coming out this fall. Work a program, be in a program, either a book that takes you through steps or a 12 step program that takes you through the 12 steps, work a program. So when it comes to pursuing purity, some of us just need extra support and we don't get it. I can't tell you the number of times I'll have somebody come into my office and I've been trying everything. I've tried everything. Really, Jennifer, I've tried everything, but they've actually never entered a recovery program. They've never had a sponsor. They've never worked a program. Um, they haven't gone to a therapist for it. So there's a lot of tools out there. Yes, there's books. Yes, there's brothers and sisters to support you. Get all the support that you need to pursue this. God, God uh, is a God that is compassionate and he wants to help us and our brothers and sisters want to help us. The other piece that doesn't happen when people are pursuing um, purity is purity in the sense of not doing pornography or masturbation or any kind of sexual addiction is they don't have a plan. Um, a plan might include, yes, putting protections on your devices, gain a godly view of sexuality. Don't just stop. Like, you know, that story that Jesus tells about how um, the guy cleans out his house and then seven demons move back in. We can't just get rid of the junk. We have to put good stuff in. So we need to understand sexuality. We need to have a life that's full and rich. That's what I call embodied living here at the bottom of this. And that's a whole nother uh, topic to discuss. Living fully and richly in the body that God has given us. And then have a plan about when you feel aroused, what are you going to do? What, what are you going to pursue? Um, how are your values and how do you pull them in around sexuality? How, what do you do when you feel aroused? And then who do you call? Who's on your support team? I, when I walk people through a plan, just to give you a little taste of it, um, we first, you have to identify your pulls. We just talked about that. Do you do it when you're bored, when you're stressed or anxious? Do you use it to relax and to relieve stress? Now, this is true of married people as well. This isn't just a single person. Married people will engage in sex to relieve stress. And that actually can cause problems in a marriage. If they're using sex to deal with their stress. You might need, if you're, if you're using sex to relieve stress, you might need to go get some support for your stress. Go see a professional um, and get help. It, you might be using it for various emotions. You might be, um, you know, looking to, for a high or using it to get a high for the thrill. So find out what your pulls are. Find out what your high risk situations are and then put a plan together for those situations. So a lot of times people do pornography when they're alone. <laughs> uh, they, they masturbate to pornography when they're alone, when it's late at night. Um, so, you know, in a certain room, in a certain place. So talk to somebody about your high risk situations and put together a really clear plan on what you're gonna do when you're alone. Not just when you're pulled to do pornography, but what are you gonna do when you're alone? What are you going to do when you have a stressful day? Do you have a plan for that? Put together a plan. So those warning signs, if you have a, a stressful day at work, do you have a plan for when you're experiencing stress? Maybe you didn't think about going on pornography, but what are you going to do when you feel stressed so that that doesn't become where you turn later? Um, if your relationship is in distress and that might cause you to feel the pull towards doing it, going and getting that support for that distress so having a really specific plan for each warning sign in high risk situation is vital and important to long-term recovery. So let me, um, I'm going to even see what this next poll is. So I have another poll here for you. 
and I just realized that I went to the wrong one. So hold on. Here we go. And this one says, do you have challenges maintaining sexual holiness and how often? So you can share um, your answers on this poll. Do you have challenges with maintaining sexual holiness and how often? So yes, rarely, um, some weekly. So we've got about 30-ish percent saying yes, but rarely. We do have a small percent, about 5 ish percent that are saying never and then weekly is about 30 percent and daily is about 15 percent so yes all together is about 95 90 to 95 percent so actually the numbers that i just shared with you earlier you guys reflect that i thank you so much for answering um honestly so for those of you where it is a daily piece, that will let you know if people are trying to stop and it's daily, that's a pretty big indication of you're needing increased support. I would say that also about weekly. So anybody who's challenged with pursuit of purity on a regular basis, it probably means you're not getting enough support to get to a new place. Um, even if you're dealing with it rarely, meaning I'll have people that come in, like a, they'll say about once every three months, the challenge with once every three months or once every six months is if you're in a committed relationship, it creates a lot of pain in that relationship, but then also the impact on your spiritual relationship. So be aware that we all need support. So you guys are a reflection of um, what we really understand about how often people are challenged with purity. So we've touched on that a little bit today. So why, why should we pursue purity? I think this is really important. We have to have a deep understanding of the reason why we do things. Why steward our sexuality? Remember what we talked about earlier, you were bought at a price. Offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness, as those who have been brought from death to life. We've been brought from death to life. That's like the most amazing thing. You know, I'm always amazed when I watch um, Lazarus read. I, I wish I'd watched Lazarus. When we read about Lazarus raising from the dead, that's what happened to us. We've been brought alive from the dead. Um, Doug's going to share his story. And so I'm hoping his connection's going well. Hello, Doug. I see you. Hi. And I can hear you. Amen. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, man, you know, I, I first want to just say thank you. Uh, I have learned just so much, even I, as we're doing this and, um, and and just considering the things that I'm going to share today. Um, I, I got a lot of growing. Uh, anyway, so I, my uh, my background, I was actually raised in a uh, Jehovah's Witness home. Um, and uh, there's so many things that were just kind of going on in my life. Uh, I grew up a very talented person, uh, singing, dancing, playing drums, acting, so on and so forth. And um, when I went to uh, when I went to college, and I was kind of free at that point. Uh, I lost my virginity uh, as a freshman, um, one, because I was so popular. Um, you know, and, and uh, it, it's really strange because, you know, for me, it, it was uh, because I was so popular, I was more chased a lot. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, uh, even during that time, like I, I never really attached uh, to anyone. Uh, and although like even, um, uh, even though um, I was more, um, uh, um, uh, pr promiscuous, um, I still kind of became frustrated. You know, the spirit always spoke to me and just said, you know, Doug, you know, what you're doing is just not right. You know, it's not humane. Uh, and I would just kind of go in and out of phases. I would stop and, you know, uh, be abstinent for a period of time. Uh, eventually, uh, it came down to a point where, you know, I was in a relationship and I had a daughter outside of marriage. Uh, and uh, at at this point, um, I, I, I can say part of just kind of 
sick of the relationship and and, and the uh, up and down uh, in my life, um, I got to a point where I just said, man, you know what? I'm done. I don't care if I ever have sex again in my whole life, you know? And uh, even, uh, you know, at, after me being baptized, you know, and I was just so scarred from it that I just did not want to um, go through that that roller coaster. Um, I didn't feel like I was um, a safe person for someone, uh, uh, for a relationship, you know, I, you know, and I think even at that point, like just being at that point, just kind of being sick of women at that point was, uh, it just propelled my purity at that time. Uh, I didn't ever want to do anything with a, a woman. Uh, and then of course I met my uh, beautiful wife and things changed. Um, but some things that, that were really important to me is that, you know, as I look back at my life and, and I uh, felt like, hey, man, you know, I don't have much to give uh, to my wife that I haven't given to anyone else. You know, I've already had sex. I've already had a kid and so on and so forth. But I knew that there was one thing that I really wanted to focus on and, can, and, uh, uh, and give to her. And, and it was uh, an opportunity to be in a relationship and to be pure. Uh, so I really focused on those things and I honed on in those things. And I've always... Uh, kept myself uh, aware uh, when I was with her and not with her that I'm in the presence of God. And I always wanted to make sure that everything that I did uh, from the inside out uh, was was uh, pure uh, in my thoughts of her. Uh, and then also, you know, this scripture in uh, Ephesians, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and read it. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her body by the washing with the water through the word and to present her uh, to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or without any blemish, but holy and blameless. So, um, so I, I really wanted to make sure that I always uh, presented her as someone that would, would not be um, put out like in, in a, in a way that she was, that she was not holy and not to be respected. And I wanted to make sure that I also respected her as well. Thanks for listening, guys. Uh, thank you so much for sharing so vulnerably <laughs> about, you know, I, I think each of you has shared so vulnerably. And I think one of the things that's so powerful about all of this is that, um, we all have different ways we view ourselves, that we view sexuality, that we feel like people view us, that impact. Um, Doug, you're pointing out something really important, and that has to do with, um, honestly, sexuality is also a reflection of our need to grow in our intimacy skills. We often don't know how to be in intimate relationships. I made a mistake myself in writing the book Redeemed Sexuality. I didn't even include the intimate how to build intimate relationships in that book because it was for singles and campus and teens. They don't need that stuff. That's just in the married book. And that was so wrong. My, my second edition is going to have the how to build close intimate relationships. We all need them. And often what happens is we don't always have those skills. And so um, that's going to be the part two because that's an important part of healthy interacting, not just around sexuality, but around intimacy as well. You know, ultimately, when it comes to our sexuality and placing our sexuality in the larger picture, we often have to redefine who we are before God so that we can be who God intends us to be in relationship with others. I, I, uh, this has been, a a long journey for me, this whole, how does God feel about me that I've done since I've been in the church now for over 30, like almost 35 years and how God feels. I actually have a list. In fact, if you want this list of how God feels about you, it's now about 40, 50 scriptures long. I've just through the last 35 years, whenever I find a new one, I put it on there. You can email me at my, anybody can email me with questions, by the way, which is Jennifer Consen at yahoo.com. My name at yahoo.com. If you want that list of how God feels about you, I will send it to you. Um, but look at the words about how God feels about us. We're precious. We're beloved. We are treasured. He's, we are chosen. We're a jewel. We're the apple of his eye. 
our sexuality needs to be placed in this larger picture of who we are before God, what he calls us, how he views us, how he feels about us, and who he is. Again, this is the knowing of God. This isn't just reading your Bible and going to church. This is the knowing his character. What's he like? I'm in the middle of redoing a study I did years ago on the character of God. Um, I did every word describing God from the Thompson chain reference. I did that for about a year. Um, and now I'm doing Jesus and I'm going, I'm now in Luke and I'm writing down everything that shows you something about his character. What's he like? We need to know him so that we can look at him and go, wow, that's the knowing of him. And how does he feel about us? How does he view us? We need to look at him. And this is what anchors our sexuality. So feel free to utilize any um, resources we've talked about today. These are the two books that I have, uh, The Ransomed Journey, which I didn't put that on here today, uh, comes out this fall. These are the um, chapters in those two books. These are, if you're married, these are some communication cards. And we do have on the, there's some special offers. You can get all three books and these cards in a special offer today. And then we also have, um, I don't have the correct title, Crescenda. I forgot to change it. This, Crescenda's book is on here. And here's a bunch of other books also. Crescenda has a new book coming out as well. So we have Guy Hammond's book, Robin Widener's. I highly, if you're married, recommend Celebration of Sex. Actually, anybody can read Celebration of Sex, I think, by Douglas Rosenau. Prodigal Pursued by Michelle Smith. Real Sex by Lauren Winner. It, oh, I, for the body, read Earthen Vessels. And, um, and then definitely my books. So I hope that today actually spurs you on towards more... Um, more growth in all of these areas. And Crescenda, I can't hear you. Thank you. I see you're clapping, but I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Crescenda, we can't hear you. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? We can hear yes. you now. Awesome. Yes. Okay. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so I have the questions that okay. Yay. have been. Yeah, they're amazing questions. Thank you guys so much for sending questions in the chat. And Jennifer, thank you so much for And I think we're going to turn the chat back on. So now the chat is on and people can feel free to start commenting. Awesome. All right. So um, we have the chat now on public and private messages. So first question. Um, thank you again, Jennifer. This has been awesome. You know what? I um, A couple of comments uh, based on what people have said. You touched on this a little bit because people said they didn't have anyone to talk to. Um, yeah. So you mentioned that people should seek support. Um, yeah. If you don't feel that you have a safe disciple to talk to, please do uh, try to contact a professional. Um, both Jennifer and well, all three, Jennifer, Aaron and myself, we're all licensed uh, counselors. Um, typically, we can only practice in the state within which we are licensed. Uh, but um, I'm also a coach where I can coach people outside of my state. So if you don't have someone to talk to, please do reach out. Um, and especially if you feel triggered uh, by some of the things that we talked about today. Um, typically, once I share my story, I get uh, lots of feedback from people that they haven't talked about being sexually assaulted. So, um, all right. So the first question, um, great questions. The first one is, how do I, as a married woman, change the let's not talk about it culture, especially within the church? And Lisa says that her upbringing practiced the same thing. Uh, like not talking about puberty, reproduction, sex. So yeah. how can I help to change the let's not talk about it culture within our fellowship? 
Well, and I do think an important point is made is that it does need to start within our families, um, starting it with our own children, whatever age they are. I was teaching at the Youth and Family Conference in Denver, and I was teaching on, so I have a lesson, by the way, you, there's a lot more on my website, The Art of Intimate Marriage, for singles and marrieds, there's a lot of resources there. And on that, so theartofintimatemarriage.com, there's resources on there, and one of them is how to talk to your kids about sex. It's a, um, a class that was taught, and there's actually a few of them on there for so talking about it openly in families, buying books, there's a, um, a God's Design for Sex is a four book series on Amazon that I highly recommend for families. It starts when the child is two and three on the difference between boy and boys and girls, and then at about six, seven, eight on how babies are made. So honestly, just having some tools, that's partially why we, I wrote Redeemed Sexuality, which um, is to give parents some tools on how to talk. So starting in our families, then we also have, this is really exciting. There are groups happening right now all over the States that are using redeemed sexuality. So it's a, and you can use it in your singles groups, campus groups, teen groups, marrieds groups, where you can um, do it as a book club, where you read a chapter, talk about it. There are groups that are doing the art of intimate marriage in groups. I actually have a manual. If you're, it's not published yet, but if you want to do it in a group, um, I will send you the manual and you can use that. We are putting together the manual for redeemed sexuality, but basically it is honestly uh, talk to your family members, talk to your immediate ministry members, talk to people who you are close to start in your own life take those slides I gave you and sit down with somebody and have that conversation. So I'd say take whatever steps you can take and then talk to anybody in leadership about, Hey, can we have, I've been doing live, live webinars and, and versions uh, all throughout the world, actually the last couple of months. So mm -hmm. I'd be happy to do one for your churches. So mm -hmm. we just need to be taught and start talking and read books, yeah. start the conversation um, you can, someone asked on the chat just now, where do you buy these things? Everything that I've described is on Amazon that, it, excuse me, is on IPI. Mm -hmm. Um, you can order everything there and you can go on my website. I just put the link in the, I just put the link in the chat. So by the way, it's only on IPI that you can get the, the deal right now, the discount Yay. right now. Yay IPI. for the real discount. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a discount. Um, all right. So Linda asks, uh, what is some general advice regarding raising children in order to normalize sexuality and a positive body image? Sorry, can you read that again? No problem. What is some general advice regarding normalizing sexuality and a positive body image? So those are two separate things. Normalizing sexuality is uh, is going to be overlapping with talking about it openly and honestly. And body image, um, we also, uh, it, it's what you call um, fat talk. The only way we talk about our bodies is in terms of, so we'll sit around at dinners as disciples or at parties, which we're not doing very much now. And so, and we'll be eating something and we'll talk about how we're losing weight <laughs> and we'll talk about, you know, how many calories is, or it's called fat talk. It's so I'm also an eating disorder specialist and we do it. We, we talk about calories and weight. And so there's partially the weight culture. We need to change that culture. And um, I would change the language around again, appreciating our bodies. Our bodies are absolutely amazing. So I do, um, that what I had you all do with putting your hands on the part of your body you're not fond of, I send people home to do the Psalm 119, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made wow. around every part of their body. And then also, I think um, living, figuring out how to live an embodied life where we really appreciate what our bodies can do when we hike. We really appreciate what it feels like when you're in a river or in the ocean and in a lake and you can feel the water on your skin, like appreciating how amazing our bodies are, turn on the music 
<laughs> dance. Like our bodies are amazing and we often have to recapture our amazing bodies that it's not just about appearance that is very influenced by media, but it's also about how God made them and how amazing, all the amazing things they can do. Amen. And I want to also say that your book um, has a section on how yes. to talk to children. Yes. And so it has a whole section on body image mm -hmm. in both books, both the married book and the, and redeemed sexuality has a whole section on body image and it has a whole section on how to, how to talk to your kids. I'm also, as we're doing this, Cassandra, noticing some questions. Yes. So I have a whole list. Here's the next one. So how do you reconcile God's love and protection with a traumatic event such as a rape or sexual abuse trauma? Yeah. Uh, how does someone overcome the shame and embrace yeah. God's love? Yeah. I think so. Boy, I need to get my book published. Okay. I have a whole chapter on it, <laughs> but I, a lot of times I, I worked with the woman. She was raped when she was 15 and she became a disciple when she was older. And she said, I just want to know where was he? Why did he let that happen? She goes, I've actually been struggling in my faith. You know, like, why would God let that happen? And one of the pieces that I uh, did in working with her that I work with multiple individuals is we do often have to relearn who God is. It um, Trauma creates what I would call spiritual crises often, where we wonder about who God is and where is he, which is a big question in the world at large. There are multiple different books, but I actually find it important to look at how does he respond when we are in trouble? And there's a lot of different ways he responds. Sometimes he stops it from happening. He's the wall. He's the fire. He's the cloud. He stops it. Other times he is there with us in the or he scoops us up in the middle of the battle. He just takes us out. If you look at all from the Old Testament, to the new, you'll see different ways he deals with when we're in trouble. Sometimes he scoops us out. Sometimes he's there with us in it. And he literally what the scriptures say that when we're distressed, he's distressed. So he, he doesn't scoop us out of the problem, but he's with us in it. And then other times the whatever bad thing that happens, happens. He then, like with Elijah, just takes us home. So there are different ways that God protects us. And sometimes the protection happens in eternity. And it doesn't necessarily, those problems still happen here. So I would say the biggest thing about the spiritual crisis that happens with uh, sexual trauma is re-putting our eyes on who God is and where his presence is when we're in the midst of whatever awful thing is happening, including in sexual trauma. Hey, could I add something to that, Jennifer? Yes. Uh, because this was my personal journey. And so for me, I did go to therapy. Uh, trauma typically requires that we see a professional therapist. And so I went to therapy um, early on and then started going consistently in 2003. And God was kind enough to help me to understand that all of our memories and our emotions are stored subconsciously. And so my supervisor, when I uh, went for my licensing, he introduced me to timeline therapy. And that really changed my life because I still was stuck with those memories and I needed neuroplasticity to rewire the things that were in my head so I could let God's word in uh, because I was so full of the negative emotions and the limiting beliefs. Um, so that has been life changing for me uh, tremendously, amazingly. So uh, we might have time for one more question and then we're gonna pray and close out. I don't know if you wanna offer to stay a little bit later, but one more question. Uh, let me just, before we go there, let me just say some of the practicals. This is being recorded to answer yes. some of that. And if any of you don't get an answer today, I value every question. Send it to me by email. Sounds good. And your email address again is? Yes. Jennifer Conzen, my name, at yahoo.com. The, right. email, the email address is located on the uh, top part as a sticky of the chat. Ah, great. No, no, one, no one else can hear me, by the way. 
<laughs> Nobody can hear. Us. So the email address is on the sticky on the chat. Yeah, up at the top. And Paul, could you add my little thing too? Yeah. All right. So the last, last question, question, because we only have a few more minutes before we're going to close in prayers. How do how does one deal with the struggle or masturbation, especially this is such a great question during these times of the pandemic when physical touch is restricted or not happening at all? Wow. Great question. Yeah. And somebody asked also about physical touch for singles. And I wish we had more time to go into the details, but yes, our bodies are skin hungry. God made us to need touch and intimacy and closeness is vital. So the world's response actually has been move in with somebody and have sex with them during the COVID time and all of your needs will be met. So I don't necessarily recommend that by the way. However, one of the pieces that is important is to talk to somebody about your need for touch. We j I would start there. This kind of almost sounds like I'm sending the question off on the side, but it's important to start talking about, hey, I need a hug. Are we telling each other that? And then if you're feeling more challenges during this time, I get asked this a lot. Are people feeling more challenges during this time? Um, possibly, possibly not because depression can lower sexual desire actually. So if you're in a depressed state, you might not be feeling it as much. Other people might be more challenged because of the isolation. Isolation does sometimes cause more challenges. So there's a, a multiple of different things. How well are you filling up your house? Mm -hmm. How well are you living an embodied life? How, when's the last time you went with a friend and maybe you're 10 feet apart with masks on and turn on the music mm -hmm. and sit in your backyard where there's lots of airflow and dance and mm -hmm. laugh. Mm -hmm. And so touch, when I say it's a human need, like literally you have uh, chemicals, oxytocin floods the body when you're in being cuddled. So our body responds well to touch. And we are in a bit of a dilemma right now with everything going on in the world. So you can get oxytocin from multiple different ways, by hiking, by hugging, by having sex, by having a great prayer time and singing. So actually oxytocin doesn't just flood the body in the midst of a sexual release or in the midst of a, a hug. It actually floods the body when you're using when you're using your body in a really enriched enlivened way so i would check how you're using your body are you going on walks where you can see the beauty around you if you don't have somewhere beautiful right around you can you go somewhere beautiful so vital to enliven how you use your body Oh man, I love gospel music. It does it for me. Yes, go dance, go sing. That's what I was doing this morning. Go hike, go paint. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Well, I wanted to see, Jennifer, if you had any closing comments or thoughts, um, and then we'll have Aaron to close out in prayer for us. I think my closing comment would be, these kinds of things are can be a one hit wonder where we just spent the last two hours having some great conversations and people sharing follow up, do talk with somebody, get a book, pray about it, join a group. Um, I create support within your ministry, get with a friend. Don't let a day like today just be the one hit wonder. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jennifer. I love you. You're it's awesome. been lovely being with all of you. Send me any questions. Awesome. You're so kind to be willing to do that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Aaron, you want to close out, close us out in prayer? I don't know if he's connected. Uh, he, his video is his, his square is there. Can you connect <laughs> the sound? <Aaron? laughs> or Paul, would you like to close out, us out in prayer or Tim? How about that? There we go. Can you hear me? Okay. Whichever one of you guys want to close us out in prayer, we'll take it. All right. I'm just making sure you can hear me. All right. My husband's going to close us out in prayer. Thank you so much. I got it, Paul. Uh, Father, this thanks for um, technology, even though it's got its glitches and yeah. problems and bugs, but we still got some stuff done, which has been amazing. Appreciate yeah. these. Crescinda, Jennifer, Paul, 
Aaron and all their hard work and Doug to uh, just put together um, this class for just members of the body, people that are maybe just dialed in have from friends of members. And God, we just pray for your spirit to go out to encourage them not to feel shame or to go hide under a rock, but to be encouraged to come out to talk, to get open about um, some of the problems and even challenges and traumas that have happened in their background to get the they need. And God, we just thank you for your grace. Um, we don't deserve it. Um, we know we're all, we're all sinners. God, we're just trying to get to heaven. So help yeah. us as, as a body, as friends, yeah. just to help each other, just to get to heaven and cross that finish line. Uh, thanks for your word. Thanks for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, God. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We can leave it on for just a few more minutes, and um, I'll, anyone who wants to download the PowerPoint. So if you want to download the PowerPoint, you can do that if you're still listening. Go to files on the right-hand side. Is that what we do, Paul? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it's actually on the bottom of most people's screen where it says okay. offer. On the bottom of your little... screen. I don't know if they can hear. Can, I don't know if they can hear you, Paul, so I'm just They repeating. can. Okay, you can. I just, I just realized... Okay. So where do we go to download the PowerPoint? They can go on the bottom of their screen where it says file. Okay. It's not on ours, yeah. Good to know. All right. Oh, I see it. <laughs> I see yeah. it. Yes. So if you want to download the PowerPoint, Sexuality Redeemed, click on files. If you want to purchase Jennifer and Tim's books, um, or my book, click on offers. Yeah. Or go to IPI website. Yes. I also put the link in the uh, chat. Thank you for your help, Paul. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> So I don't know if we're still live or not. <laughs> don't say anything that we are. We are. Bye. Bye.